Hello, boys and girls. We're finally getting to something on my reading list that I find very exciting. I will be reading this to you because of Newsweek's recent article lamenting how those crazy conspiracy theories are, are messing up responsible policies and all the kooky wackos out there believing this stuff is just making the national discourse ridiculous. In light of that, I would like to read from the documents from Operation Northwoods, which were recently declassified. If you would like, you can go online, do a search for Operation Northwoods PDF, find the scanned documents, and then, boys and girls, you can read along at home. This document was once classified top secret. It has since been declassified. This is from 1962. It is a Joint Chiefs of Staff document where they discuss the, quote, pretext which would provide justification for U.S. military intervention in Cuba. And this document describes a, quote, preliminary submission suitable for planning purposes. It is signed by L. L. Lemnitzer, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff under the Kennedy administration. Among the things it says is this, quote, World opinion and the United Nations Forum should be favorably affected by developing the international image of the Cuban government as rash and irresponsible and as an alarming and unpredictable threat to the peace of the Western Hemisphere. Now, boys and girls, you might be wondering, how would people get that impression? Maybe this is about the U.S. government pointing out the evils of the Castro regime, of which there are many. No, quote, the suggested courses of action appended to enclosure A satisfactorily respond to the statement of the problem. You are about to hear the proposed solution that will accomplish the stated goal as approved, as proposed and approved by the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Now, Perhaps someday we can do a separate reading of the documents from Operation Mongoose, which these documents reference. You can read that for extra credit, boys and girls. Quote, the projects listed in the enclosure here too, which we're about to get to, are forwarded as a preliminary submission suitable for planning purposes. In other words, let's do these things. It is assumed that there will be similar submissions from other agencies and that these inputs will be used as a basis for developing a time-phased plan. The individual projects can then be considered on a case-by-case -case basis. So they are acknowledging there will be other government agencies making similar suggestions. The desired resultant from the execution of this plan would be to place the United States in the apparent position of suffering defensible grievances from a rash and irresponsible government of Cuba, and to develop an international image of a Cuban threat to peace in the Western Hemisphere. Golly, boys and girls, how do you think they're going to create that image? Since it would seem desirable to use legitimate provocation as the basis for U.S. military intervention in Cuba, a cover and deception plan could be executed as an initial effort to provoke Cuban reactions. That's pretty bad, boys and girls. We're going to start a fight to make the other guy look bad? That's, that sounds bad. Harassment plus deceptive actions to convince the Cubans of imminent invasion would be emphasized. Our military posture throughout execution of the plan will allow a rapid change from exercise to intervention if Cuban response justifies. Number two. A series of well-coordinated incidents will be planned to take place in and around Guantanamo to give genuine appearance of being done by hostile Cuban forces. That's called false flag operations, boys and girls, where you commit unjust acts and then blame it on somebody else. Incidents to establish a credible attack include the following. Start rumors, many. Use clandestine radio. Land friendly Cubans in uniform over the fence to stage attack on base in Guantanamo. Capture Cuban friendly saboteurs inside the base. Start riots near the base main gate. Friendly Cubans starting those riots. Five, blow up ammunition inside the base. Start fires. Six, 
burn aircraft on airbase, parentheses, sabotage. Seven, lob mortar shells from outside of base into base, some damage to installations. Eight, capture assault teams approaching from the sea or vicinity of Guantanamo City. Nine, capture militia group which storms the base. Ten, sabotage ship and harbor, large fires, naphthalene. Eleven, sink ship near harbor entrance, conduct funerals for mock victims. United States would respond by executing offensive operations to secure water and power supplies, destroying artillery and mortar emplacements which threaten the base. C. Commence large-scale United States military operations. Do you understand, boys and girls? This is the U.S. government planning to carry out false flag attacks in order to justify a prolonged military action which would cost lots of lives of soldiers and civilians on both sides for years to come. Number three, a Remember the Main incident could be arranged in several forms. Now, boys and girls, for extra credit, you can look up the USS Maine, which these documents are essentially admitting was sunk by the United States government. They sunk their own ship in order to get public support for military action against Cuba. So let me back up. A Remember the Maine incident could be arranged in several forms. Quote, we could blow up a U.S. ship in Guantanamo Bay and blame Cuba. Newsweek. You listening? We could blow up a U.S. ship in Guantanamo Bay and blame Cuba, quote, end quote, U.S. Joint Chiefs of Staff. B. We could blow up a drone, unmanned vessel anywhere in the Cuban waters. We could arrange to cause such incident in the vicinity of Havana or Santiago as a spectacular result of a Cuban attack from the air or sea, or both. The presence of Cuban planes or ships merely investigating the intent of the vessel could be fairly compelling evidence that the ship was taken under attack. The U.S. could follow up with an air-slash-sea rescue operation covered by U.S. fighters to evacuate remaining members of the non-existent crew. Casualty lists in U.S. newspapers would cause a helpful wave of national indignation. Let me read that again, boys and girls. They will pretend, they will stage an attack, blame it on Cuba, pretend a lot of innocent people have died. Why would they do that? Because, quote, casualty lists in U.S. newspapers would cause a helpful wave of national indignation, end quote. Newsweek, you listening? Four, quote, U.S. Joint Chiefs of Staff, we could develop a communist Cuban terror campaign in the Miami area, in other Florida cities, and even in Washington. This is the top officials in the U.S. military, in the Joint Chiefs of Staff, saying, quote, we could develop a communist Cuban terror campaign in the Miami area, in other Florida cities, and even in Washington. The terror campaign could be pointed at Cuban refugees seeking, seeking haven in the United States. We could sink a boatload of Cubans en route to Florida, real or simulated. Maybe we'll fake it. Maybe we'll kill some innocent people. We could foster attempts on lives of Cuban refugees in the United States even to the extent of wounding, wounding in instances to be widely publicized, to get that helpful wave of national indignation, no doubt. Exploding a few plastic bombs in carefully chosen spots, the arrest of Cuban agents and the release of prepared documents substantiating Cuban involvement, that would be forged documents, also would be helpful in projecting the idea of an irresponsible government, meaning of Cuba. And it goes on in detail. Another item it mentions is use of MiG-type aircraft by U.S. pilots could provide additional provocation. An F-86, properly painted, would convince air passengers that they saw a Cuban MiG. Seven, 
hijacking attempts against civil air and surface craft should appear to continue as harassing measures condoned by the government of Cuba. Hijacking attempts against civil air and surface craft should appear to continue as harassing measures condoned by the government of Cuba. It is possible to create an incident which will demonstrate convincingly that a Cuban aircraft has attacked and shot down a chartered civil airliner en route from the United States to Jamaica, Guatemala, Panama, or Venezuela. The passengers could be a group of college students off on a holiday, or any group of persons with a common interest to support chartering a non-scheduled flight. And it goes into detail. Here are some of the details so you get the flavor of it. An aircraft at Eglin Air Force Base would be painted and numbered as an exact duplicate for a civil registered aircraft belonging to a CIA proprietary organization in the Miami area. At a designated time, the duplicate would be substituted for the actual civil aircraft and would be loaded with the selected passengers, all boarded under carefully prepared aliases. The actual registered aircraft would be converted to a drone. Newsweek, wake up. You in the back row, pay attention. Takeoff times of the drone aircraft and the actual aircraft will be scheduled to allow a rendezvous south of Florida. From the rendezvous port, nobody would ever try a, uh, a conspiracy this. Oh, yes, they would. From the rendezvous point, the passenger carrying aircraft will descend to a minimum altitude and go directly into an auxiliary field at Eglin Air Force Base where arrangements were, will have been made to evacuate the passengers and return the aircraft to its original status. The drone aircraft, meanwhile, will continue to fly the filed flight pan. When over Cuba, the drone will begin being transmitting on the international distress frequency a mayday message stating he is under attack by Cuban MiG aircraft. The transmission will be interrupted by destruction of the aircraft, which will be triggered by radio signal. It is possible to create an incident which will make it appear that communist Cuban MiGs have destroyed a U.S. Air Force aircraft over international waters in an unprovoked attack. On one such flight, a pre-briefed pilot would fly tail end Charlie at considerable interval between aircraft. While near the Cuban island, this pilot would broadcast that he had been jumped by MiGs and was going down. No other calls would be made. The pilot would then fly directly west at extremely low altitude and land at a secure base, an Eglin Auxiliary. The aircraft would be met by the proper people, quickly stored and given a new tail number. The, the pilot who had performed the mission under an alias would resume his proper identity and return to his normal place of business. The pilot and the aircraft would then have disappeared. At precisely the same time that the aircraft was presumably shot down, a submarine or small surface craft would disperse F-101 parts, parachute, etc. at approximately 15 to 20 miles off the Cuban coast and depart. The pilots returning to Homestead would have a true story as far as they knew. Search ships and aircraft could be dispatched and parts of aircraft found. The end, boys and girls. So to you state-worshipping fascist morons at Newsweek and the Southern Poverty Law Center, please shut the hell up and stop kissing the butt of the most evil, murderous people on the planet and pretending that, golly, they just mean well, they just want to help us. And for anybody who reads Newsweek, don't anymore, because it's statist BS. By the way, this reading was brought to you by Insight Tees, where you can get a cool t-shirt like this and several other designs. This would be a non-aggression principle, nap time. It's awesome, it's brilliant. Until our next story time, boys and girls, remember, don't ever trust the people who claim the right to rule you.